because there are there is coffee and rolls back there. Some of them have your names on them. Okay, well, good morning. My name is Nikki Ellsbury, and I've had the great pleasure of working on the planning committee for this event. I'm also a financial advisor here in Greeley with Edward Jones. And when we were thinking about potential speakers, Dr. Kate Warren immediately came to my mind. Uh, she's with Edward Jones in St. Louis. She is a principal with the firm and is also a member of the Investment Policy Advisory Committee. She's our strategist for the U.S. and Canada and is responsible for interpreting market conditions and recommending appropriate long-term investment strategies to aid more than 7 million Edward Jones clients in reaching their investment and financial goals. She's highly regarded in our industry and has appeared on uh, CBS, CNBC, CNN, and Canada's CBC and Business News Network. She's been quoted in major news publications, including the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Globe and Mail, Forbes, and Fortune magazine. She holds a doctorate in economics, specializing in finance and competitive strategy from Yale University, a major, uh, uh, excuse me, in um, I lost my place. She holds a doctorate in economics, specializing in finance and competitive strategy from Yale University, a Master of Science from the London School of Economics, and a bachelor's degree with high honors from Swarthmore College. She earned her Chartered Financial Analyst designation in 1997. Ms. Orne has worked for AT&T and General Motors. She was an assistant professor of finance at the John M. Allen School of Business at Washington University in St. Louis. She previously lectured at Yale University and was an economist at the President's Council of Economic Advisors. I'm so thrilled she can be a part of um, the Women in Business Forum today and know you will benefit from her expertise and knowledge. Um, join me in welcoming Dr. Kate Warren. my fault I didn't turn the microphone on as I came up. I'm delighted to be here. I am going to talk about basically what's going on in the financial markets, what's happening with the economy, and I think that's actually pretty important for all of us right now. It turns out that uh, there's some things that you know about women. First of all, that we tend to recruit less than men, although the people who've done the studies ne don't necessarily say that's true if you correct for all the jobs and all the things, but basically where women learn, earn less over time, and we also tend to live longer. Now that, of course, means that when we retire, we saved up, this is uh, every time I move, it's not working. All right, I may have to go to a handheld. Um, basically, we need to have saved more for retirement. That would make sense, right? Um, but instead, it turns out that women invest more cautiously than men do. They tend to take less risk to me of less return. Can I just grab one of those handheld mics? So since I, since I seem to turn away. Anyhow, um, basically that means that in many cases, by the time women get to retirement, they have less. And one of the things I hope to do today is to explain enough about financial markets, about investing, to make that not happen to you. I think this, this should do better. Uh, make it so that uh, that doesn't happen to you, and also explain to you why I think today's a really good time to put money into stocks or the equity side of the stock market. So let's take a look at the stock market. This is the U.S. stock market going back to 1926, and these are the monthly percent changes in the S&P 500. Look like anything you'd like to invest in? No, looks pretty bad. In fact, uh, a friend of mine said it looked like an EKG, and then somebody else quipped that if you spend too much time trying to predict the monthly percent changes in the market, you're likely to end up with a heart attack. But I think this is how many women do think about investing, because what we hear is lots of things about things have gone up, things have gone down. And if you're trying to predict the changes in the market from month to month, this is how you're looking at stocks. Very scary, not very reassuring. If instead you take a look at how the market has taken $100 and converted it over time, 
And this is how we tend to look at investing at Edward Jones. You put your money to work, you reinvest the dividends, you leave it there. $100 invested back in 1926 would have turned into almost $260,000 at the end of 2009. So basically, over a long period of time, you can grow wealth by not paying attention to those monthly moves in the market, but instead staying invested. So one of the things that many women need to do is focus on staying invested over time rather than the changes in the value of your portfolios because it's only when you stay invested over time that you're going to collect those long-term returns that are available in the marketplace. Now, this is a different version of the same numbers. This is uh, Ibbotson data, and what they did was take a look at $1 invested uh, over, again, 1926 through the end of 2009. And small stocks did even better than those large stocks represented by the S&P 500. So small stocks in the blue line at the top, uh, the returns were about 11% per year, S&P 500 just under 10% per year. But then the place that women tend to put their money is down in those safe investments, the treasury bonds, not so good, and even worse, treasury bills, which many people think are the safest. They are, because basically you're getting your money back every couple of months but they barely have a return above inflation, which is one of the things that long-term investors need to worry about the most. Now, your asset allocation is just a fancy term. The financial industry is great for fancy terms for simple things that tells you what percentage you own in each of these kinds of investments. So your asset allocation, your mix of investments, is really critical, but when women are choosing that, they tend to put too much in the safer side, the fixed income side, not enough in the stock side. And so one of the things I'm going to try to talk about is why is it you should invest in stocks over time. The second thing that tends to happen is that even on a shorter period of time, and this data is through the end of 2008, it's the S&P 500 again, uh, but it's a 20-year time snapshot, much more like we, what we would invest in. The S&P 500, or the benchmark return on the equity side, the big purple bar, give you a return of 8.4% per year. That's pretty good, right? You're making money, your money's doubling more, than that, more frequently than 10 years. But actual investors, and this is the study that got done that's a little scary, they got those small blue bars, the 1.9% on the equity side and the 8 tenths of per percent on the fixed income side. So actual investors didn't get what was available just by staying invested over those 20 years what they got was a lot less. Why do you think they got so much less? What did they do? Sold out. They sold, yeah. So what did they sell? They sold when things were down, and they bought right after things had run up. They tended to move into things that had just done well, and so what were they doing? They were selling low and buying high, and we all know, even if you don't know much about investing, we all know that one of the rules is you're always trying to buy low and sell high, right? So they're doing exactly the wrong things. And they're trading far too frequently. Now, another study actually looked at the difference between men and women in terms of how often they traded and what did they do. The interesting thing is women do a lot better here than men do. So they pick more conservative investments, but the really good news is they tend to stick with them more, they trade less, so they trade a lot less frequently. They tend to be more conservative and do more research in their choices. So women are sort of doing a better job of investing. What they're really doing is not picking as good an asset allocation in terms of giving them the returns they're likely to need to be able to achieve their long-term financial goals. So this was really revealing to me, which was if people just stayed invested a bit better, then what they'd be able to do is get the returns available in the marketplace as opposed to the returns that they were actually getting. What happens though? We know that the market goes through times, just like we've seen over the last year or two, where it dips, it corrects. And in fact, we've seen uh, almost 400 times where the market's dropped 5% or more since 1900. Those, the financial markets called dips, so little ones, and we've actually seen one of those this year. Uh, the market tends to go down 10% or more about once a year, and it goes into bear market territory or declines 20% or more about once every three or four years. We just went through one of those, so that's probably a lot more familiar right now than it is at times where the market's been going up. But with the S&P 500 up almost 70% over the last 13 months, what we haven't seen is any of those corrections, those 10% declines or bear markets since a year ago. But what I want to tell you is we're going to see more of them in the future. 
I can't tell you when. What we never know is when they'll start, when they'll end. They happen frequently. They're part of those really good returns that I've talked about earlier, the 9 or 10% per year. But you have to stay invested through them if you're going to get those long-term returns. And I think what happens in many cases is people put their money to work. They'd like it to go up. The market declines instead. And instead of figuring out that what you need to do is stay invested through this, what happens is people sell off and think, I'll do something else. I'll move my money to something safer. But of course, they're doing that at the wrong time. So I think it's really important to go into investing with reasonable expectations about what you're going to see and that you have to stay invested during these times of market declines in order to get the long-term returns that are available. Now, what do I think is going on today? Well, first of all, I think most investors need to be rebalancing. If you take a look at those uh, more than 60% gains since last year, think about it. If you had the right mix of stocks and bonds a year ago, what's happened? Your stocks have gone up a lot. And your bonds haven't gone up so much, so what do you need, probably need to be doing? You need to be adding some money on the fixed income side. But most people actually didn't have enough stocks a year ago because, of course, the price was down so much. Equities is just another term for stocks. It's sort of broader. So most people were scared to put money into work a year ago, so they actually didn't have enough then. So many people actually still need to be adding money on the stock side. But that's one of the keys, that mix of investments. The more you keep your money aligned with what your target asset allocation is, the better your returns and less risky your uh, portfolio is likely to be over time. Second, how many of you have heard that the Fed might raise interest rates sometime soon? Most of you, okay. Not, we don't think this year, uh, maybe later in 2010, but no time soon, but a lot of people are beginning to worry about the possibility of changing interest rates. And many people, the people who matter, that matters the most for, are people who, in fact, own fixed income portfolios. Because bonds, long-term bonds, tend to be the most sensitive to changes in interest rates. We think the most important thing to be doing now as a strategy in advance of what might be a changing rate environment is to be sure you've got a mix of long, short-term, and intermediate-term bonds. That's just called laddering. It's a way to make sure your portfolio has some income, but at the same time isn't too sensitive to changes in long-term interest rates. Despite the gains in the market over the past year, I think now is a great time to be putting money into stocks. I'm going to talk about that a little later. But a particular kind of stocks, and it's ones that pay dividends and historically have increased their dividends, and we expect to increase in the future. The reason is they've actually not done as well as some of the other parts of the market over the past year. They tend to be steadier, bigger companies. They tend to be the ones that do well as the market gets into a second or third year of a rebound. The last thing is, I think it's a great time to be investing internationally. Many people think about diversifying their portfolios, for like I talked about it, in stocks and bonds, but they don't think about putting money outside of the US. And international is still a great opportunity, and I'll talk a bit about that as well. In terms of diversification, though, and rebalancing, there are two types that are important. The first is, if you're going to be building your own equity portfolio, you need to be sure that you've got a mix of different industries or sectors in the market. What I've got here are the last 10 years across uh, the, in each of the columns, and the best performing sector is color-coded at the top, and the worst performing is color-coded at the bottom. Sort of looks like a patchwork quilt, right? In other words, a variety of different uh, industries. But uh, the main reason I put this up is that there's no pattern. There's no one industry you always want to own. There's no one that's always the terrible thing to own. And there's actually a slight tendency, as people have done studies, for the ones that do the worst to reverse. So what we talk about when we talk about diversification is making sure that if you're building your own equity portfolio, your own stock portfolio, that you own all of those industries and that you don't let things get too out of balance, like during the tech bubble, that you didn't own too much technology, or a couple of years ago that you didn't own too much financial services, which then proceeded to head to the bottom of each of the next years, and uh, that uh, you're always rebalancing, adding something to the areas that haven't done so well. There's a second kind of diversification, which relates to the asset allocation. These are the last 12 times that the stock market has gone down for a full calendar year. That's the negative blue bars on the bottom, is what happened to the S&P 500. But the reason that we think almost everybody needs to own some fixed income, even if you're relatively young and you've got a long time before you need the money, is because it helps buffer declines in your portfolio. It makes it a lot more likely that you're going to stay invested during one of those stock market declines 
Because take a look at what happens to the green bar, what happens to your fixed income. It goes up in each of those. So wouldn't you feel better owning something that went, you know, had a, having a piece of your portfolio that moved higher during each of the years where you're seeing all the headlines about how much the stock market has declined? For most people, that helps them stay invested, and it's part of the reason that that original asset allocation is so important, is you're wanting to own some of each of those. So if you own the stocks and you also have some fixed income, what you've done is balance your portfolio over time. We might want to make sure you own quality investments, though. And in, at Edward Jones, we would only offer a bond that, in, that has, uh, is, is not junk rated, is not non-investment grade. And many people over the last year or two have heard a lot about how the rating agencies haven't done such a good job, because they, of course, were the ones that certified subprime mortgages as being AAA rated. When you take a look at the corporate bonds that they rate, though, and these are the default rates going back to 1980 organized by the various category of bond as it was initially rated. You can certainly see why when we're talking about quality investments and what we think should, that you should always be looking as quali at quality investments for a long-term portfolio, that you really want to stick to the ones rated investment grade. That's true whether you own your bonds individually or in a bond fund, that what you don't want to be doing is going over to those non-investment grade, the ones in yellow, that's where the junk bonds are, where you can see the very, very high default rates. Now I'm going to talk some about the various issues that people have, because I've sort of introduced, all right, so these are the investments, these are the kinds of things people own. But right now, people are concerned about what's happening with the economy, uh, what happens, what's happening with interest rates, where we're going to see the, uh, the, what's going to happen with the debt. We have a huge amount of hard, huge federal deficits and the debt. And then I'm going to talk some more about where, you, where to put money to work. So let's start by looking at the economy. Turns out if you look back over the last few years, the US economy has been increasing 86% uh, of the time, the going up, not in recession, 86% of the time since 1957, and 95% of the time since the really severe recession in 1982 ended. We just went through one of the most severe recessions that we've experienced since the Great Depression. In fact, there was a lot of worry that we would see Great Depression too a year ago. And if I'd been speaking to you then, that would have been everybody's first question was, were we, were we headed into another Great Depression? The answer uh, seems to be no. Certainly at this point, we've just come through a really nasty downturn. And these are the quarterly percent changes in the US economy. This is uh, what you're probably used to seeing. What we saw was more than a 6% decline in the first, first quarter a year ago. And then the economy's actually moved into positive territory in terms of overall economic growth starting in the third quarter of last year with a very strong fourth quarter. Now I'm sure many of you have heard that we're in a less than normal rebound, that this is going to be a time when we don't see the economy pick up as strongly as it has historically. But interestingly enough, if you look at most forecasts right now, they're calling for about 3% GDP growth through the rest of the year. And that's pretty much in line with historical averages. It's stronger than the, than the first year after the last two recessions, it's not as strong as previous recessions before that, where they were deeper and then the rebounds tended to be also much stronger. But we're looking at this and saying, we're probably through a very nasty recession. The Federal Reserve, other policies, actually took, kept us from going into a much worse downturn. And we're now not in a period of really strong growth, but 3% is good enough in terms of beginning to get people back to work. We saw job creation for the first time in March. And a positive direction in terms of the overall economy. So we're back into that 95% range where the economy tends to keep growing. Stock investors, though, always are saying, well, if we know the economy heads into periodic recessions, should we be buying if we know the economy is headed into a downturn? These things happen every now and then. So we took a look at that because we're still getting questions on, well, if the economy weakens, shouldn't I keep my money out of the stock market? Shouldn't I be still on the sidelines? Because people are talking about the possibility of a double dip, right? I'm sure we've all heard about that. Could the economy head back into recession? So what do you think? If you take $10,000 invested on the very first day of the recession, we don't actually ever know when that's going to happen, but let's pretend you could do that. And you stay invested through a year later. You think you have more money or less money at the end of the year? This is easy, more or less. More, okay, you're right. Turns out that you end up with 
about a return almost of 10%, you end up with 10,800, almost $10,900. So many people think, oh my gosh, you're investing at the beginning of a recession, can't have positive returns. Turns out it's a little bit positive. And if you stay invested, no surprise, what you end up with is an increasing amount over the following two years, five years, and 10 years. In fact, your returns are pretty good if you put your money to work at the beginning of a given recession. This is looking incidentally at the last 11 recessions. So this is an historical average for US data. But let's say you can perfectly time the market, the, the recession, and you put your money to work at the very last day of the recession. The most recent one, we don't actually know exactly when it ended. What do you think would happen then? Do you make more money or less money? And I'm getting lesses, interesting. Okay, turns out it's not all that different. Put your money to work, a year later you've got a little more because you're investing at the end of the recession, but three years later, five years later, 10 years later, it's almost no different. So the answer is, instead of trying to pay a lot of attention to where we are in the economic cycle, instead put your money to work when you've got it because the longer you have it working for you, the higher your returns tend to be because you've got that time working to your advantage. So one of the key messages is invest earlier, don't worry too much about the economic cycle because it turns out that over long periods of time, the differences are really pretty small. You can see this on another chart. This is sort of the graphical version of the numbers I just put up, which is the market actually tends to decline in advance of when the economy begins to head into recession. If you look historically, that's because the market is a leading indicator of the economy. It tends to start declining about six months in advance. That's the blue line up there. You can see the vertical line when the recession starts. Market continues on down. But the interesting thing is the stock market tends to bottom about six months before recessions end. Typically, US recessions have lasted a little less than a year. And then the market continues to rise as the economic news begins to get better, as companies report stronger earnings. We see people going back to work and spending more. Basically, all of that process continues to help the market move higher afterward. And that's the blue line you can see over on the right. We're now probably about six months after the end of the recession. They haven't dated it yet, but it probably ended sometime last fall. So we're solidly in that area, and the market continues on, usually for a year or two, without much other than those short-term pullbacks. But I want to talk right now about some of the impacts of the policies taken to help end the recession and to make it milder than what everybody thought it was going to be a year or 18 months ago. The first thing was we saw the Federal Reserve cut interest rates to the lowest ever. They're now between a quarter and zero percent. We've never seen short-term interest rates that low. And everyone, of course, expects that they'll move higher at some point as the economy gets back on its footing. The second thing is that uh, we also saw the government put a big sti stimulus plan in place, almost $800 billion. A lot of that money is actually getting spent now. The U.S. deficit rose to about 10% of GDP, increasing the debt. We're now in trillions of dollars of debt. The deficit's trillions, the debt is trillions. And so I want to talk some about the impact of being in a world of higher deficits and higher debt. The third consequence of the things done during the downturn is actually regulations to fix the banks. I'm not going to talk much about that because we're still seeing that go through Congress. It's a little hard to tell what's going to happen there, but the bottom line is we're likely to see more restrictions on financial services companies. We may or may not see things that will actually do much in terms of preventing another financial meltdown. They happen about every 20 years, so I wouldn't hold my breath and say the, the things that happen today will prevent the next one, but there's really not much to talk about in terms of specific implications, so I'm going to really focus on the first two the red interest rates. If you take a look historically, and this goes back to 1970, long-term interest rates are in dark blue there. You can see that they rose up until the early 80s and then have been on a really, a very, a very, a very steady downturn since 1982. The short-term rates in red are the three-month treasury bill rates. They're very similar to the federal funds rate, but you can see that they, similar to the, the, um, the Fed rate, are at the lowest rate ever. And that's part of why everyone's talking about we may see interest rates rise, because that short-term rate is very, very low. But you can also see from this chart that they tend to move rather differently. It was just because short-term rates are rising or falling doesn't always mean that long-term rates are going to do exactly the same thing. I do want to talk, though, if long-term rates start to rise, what that means. Because the last time we saw this, 
uh, was in fact back in the end of the 90s. And so for most people, think about the fact that since, the early, and since 1982, we've pretty much seen declining long-term rates. So most of us are sort of familiar with that environment, and we're a lot less familiar with an environment where we see, could see long-term rates begin to rise. And the basic thing to keep in mind is that rates and prices of fixed income investments move inversely. And you can see up there, up there with the teeter-totter imagery. We've been basically in an environment that's the lower one, where interest rates have been going down, so bond prices have been rising. We could suddenly end up in an environment where interest rates are going up, and thus bond prices are falling. So for those of you who own bonds, you may see on your statements over the next year or two that they're in fact lower in price. The reason we're talking about this is that it's going to be something that we haven't seen for the last 20 or so years. Many people may be surprised, but the whole reason you own those bonds is because they give you the stability to your fixed, to your, the fixed income gives you stability in your portfolio, and second, that you get a higher yield. Think about those differences between the blue line and the red line. You're getting a much higher yield right now. And it doesn't change the rate you're getting. What it does is just mean the price bounces around. And when the bond matures, you end up with the amount you, you invested originally coming back. So what should you do in an environment where you may see rates rise? Well, take a look at what those price declines might be so that you're at least aware. And the longer your, the maturity of your bond, the larger the decrease in price. You can see that here. Five-year bonds down 4% with a 1% rate rise. 30-year bonds down 13%. And if rates, long-term rates actually go up 2%, you could easily see a 25 or so percent price dec decline. So that's the magnitude of the decline we may see. But what do you want to do? Well, first of all, we've learned not to predict interest rates. One of the things that people make the most mistakes on is thinking that they know which direction interest rates are going to go. And if you don't know which interest way interest rates are going to go, what you always want to be doing is owning some short-term fixed income investments, some intermediate, and some long-term. That latter bond portfolio means your portfolio won't change nearly as much as those price decreases that we saw on what happens to uh, bond prices when rates go up. The second thing that you want to be sure that you understand is that that happens that you end up getting your money back when the bonds mature. So as long as you know that, then you're sitting there and you're okay in your fixed income portfolio. One reason that this may not happen, I mentioned that sometimes short-term rates and long-term rates don't move much, is long-term bond prices, long-term bond rates, are much more influenced by what people expect to happen with inflation than they are by what happens with the Federal Reserve policy. So the Federal Reserve can start to raise short-term rates as long as that keeps inflation expectations in line, we can actually see long-term bond rates not change much at all. This is the recent history on inflation expectations. You can see that people expect inflation to be a little above 2%. Right now, it's uh, around 2.5%, so a bit higher than the long-term average, but nothing out of line, nothing that's suggesting that we're likely to see long-term bond prices decline a lot or long-term rates go up very much because they're far more tied to inflation expectations than they are to Federal Reserve policy. So we know that short-term rates may begin to go up later this year, perhaps in early 2011. Long-term rates, much more difficult to forecast. The second thing that we also know happened in terms of trying to keep the economy from heading into such a deep recession was that the federal government spent a lot more money. And these are projections of what the debt to GDP ratio is going to look like for a number of countries around the world, starting with 2008, which is the most recent year we've got the data for at this stage for all these countries, and the projections that the IMF did for 2014. Now, the US is on the far right. And the reason I've got these other countries is to show you that this is not just a problem in the US. It's a problem around the world. U.S. debt to GDP ratio was around 40% at the end of 2008. It's around 55% uh, today, and it's projected to go up to around 80%. Very similar picture for the U.K., where, of course, we know that uh, they're spending a lot of money and still in recession. Uh, if you keep working back to the left, in Japan, they already have a much higher debt to GDP ratio, and the deficits they're running are going to push it up to about double what the rest of the world is at. Uh, if you take a look at the Eurozone, it's a mixture of countries that have much higher debt-to-GDP ratios and ones that are much lower. 
for example, Greece, where we've all been hearing about the problems in terms of how much debt they've got. Their current debt to GDP ratio is 113. So up there above even Japan at the current level. So real differences within the Eurozone. And then Canada. The reason I've got Canada up here, their debt to GDP ratio is about 20%, projected to go to a little more than 30%. The reason I've got it up here is they had a debt to GDP ratio of above 70% back in the mid 1990s. And they chose to take a tact of reducing government spending, bringing down the debt level considerably, and that's how they ended up in such a good position today. So they essentially have already gone through what I think we'll see many other countries going through, and I'll show you what happened there in just a minute. But it turns out that for many of us, this may be the first time we've spent any time paying attention to government deficits and how big the debt is, but many countries in the past have gone through this. And they're now academic studies looking at, okay, so when countries get into debt trouble, when they get too much debt, what do they do to fix that? Because this is something that's worrying a lot of investors. People are saying, well, I'm really uncomfortable because of how big the deficits are, how much debt the government has taken on. About half the countries that have got into this trouble in the past have resolved this by what's called belt tightening, which is just a way of saying what they've done is cut or at least not allowed to increase government spending. And in many cases, they've raised taxes as well. That's worked in about half the cases. And this is called deleveraging. Uh, it's just a fancy, again, fancy financial services term for reducing the amount of debt compared to the size of the overall economy. So in that situation, what you see is the government cuts back uh, and perhaps raises taxes, but it's slow, it's something that takes a while to work out, but eventually it does what Canada did, brings back down the level of debt compared to the overall economy. The second possibility is we just see countries default. They owe a lot and they say, we won't pay. Sort of happens to borrowers, that's what foreclosure is on the housing market. And we could easily see that happen, probably not in the US or any of the major uh, countries around the world. But uh, Argentina, for example, has defaulted on its debt many times. Now you might ask why anybody lent the money a second time when they defaulted the first time, but that seems to be something that happens time and time again. The other thing to keep in mind is that Greece has actually defaulted or been in some kind of arrears about half of the last 200 years. So this is not new, it's not different. It's just something that we haven't typically paid a lot of attention to in the past and that we're likely to hear a lot more about as many countries have run into difficulties financially, they've borrowed a lot, and they're gonna to have to figure out either how to pay it back or do a version of restructuring, which is just a way of saying, I'm not gonna pay you what I owe you at the time, but I'll pay it to you over some longer period of time and it's worked out with the lender, so it's a bit prettier, but it's still a version of default. I think we'll see actually a lot of that. There are two other possibilities in terms of how do you fix a high level of debt compared to the overall economy. One is, and one that people have worried about, is higher inflation. Because if you have higher inflation, you end up paying back in less valuable dollars or whatever the currency is. So people have said, well, maybe we'll just see high inflation because that's a sort of cheap way to pay these, uh, pay these bills off. Well, it's not very likely because, first of all, the interest rate that you pay on the debt begins to rise really quickly. And that raises the value of the debt almost fast enough that it's not worth it. And the second thing is, for, we to, for us to see higher inflation, we'd have to suddenly have the Federal Reserve and other central banks less independent of the government than what they are today. The Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, other central banks all have a mandate to keep inflation low. And as long as they're focused on that mandate, they're not going to allow higher inflation. So they're not going to allow governments to do that as a policy to try to pay off the debt in cheaper dollars or cheaper currencies. So the last thing that some countries, a very small number, used in terms of solving their problem was to grow really quickly. Because if you look at debt to GDP, clearly one solution is you keep the debt pretty much where it is, but you grow the economy really quickly. That only worked in about three cases. It was countries that found oil or ended up with a, another natural resource fund. And as a result, what they were able to do was yes, grow the economy quickly, that's probably not going to solve the problem for most of the world's economies. We actually think that most will do a version of this belt tightening where they cut government spending, probably raise taxes. But when you take a look in the US, oh, let me talk some about investors. I'll talk then about what's going to happen in the US. When you take a look as investors and you say, all right, what happens when you start cutting 
government spending, or at least keeping it straight, you know, keeping it constant, not letting it grow so the debt to GDP ratio falls. What I've got up here is what happened to Canada back in the, uh, the mid 1990s. The debt to GDP ratio is in dark blue. You can see it rose to 70 percent, uh, about the range that the U.S. and U.K. are expected to get to, a little less. What happened that triggered the change in Canada? was their debt got downgraded by those same bond rating agencies I talked about earlier. They went from AAA to AA. That caused the government to say, we've got to fix this problem. And they slowed down and in fact began to contract government spending. So that's the blue line. Goes up quickly, comes down almost as quickly. But what I've got up there as well in the red line is the Canadian stock market. Investors are saying, I'm really worried about what's going to happen. Should Canadian investors been worried about what went on during the mid-1990s? No, the stock market kept going up. There's really no relationship to what happened between the debt to GDP ratio and what happened in the stock market. Similarly, if we take a look at the US, and this is US debt to GDP, you can see it was above 100% back during the Second World War where we financed the debts to pay for the war. That came down very, very quickly as the economy grew and the government was able to basically spend less compared to the quickness of GDP growth. Today, this doesn't have the projection on there, but if you take that IMF projection, uh, the blue line would be projected to go back up to the 80% range. But what I've got up there again is the S&P 500 in red. See any relationship? No, whether debt seems to be rising or falling, it doesn't seem to have to do much with the stock market. So as stock investors, equity investors, we think that this probably doesn't matter very much. For bond investors, back on the bond interest rate side, I think this will be one of the things that tends to help raise interest rates over the next couple of years, because you're gonna have the government continuing to issue a lot of bonds as it tries to pay for the debt, and just the supply and demand alone is likely to raise rates a bit, although not dramatically in our view. So we're looking at this and saying, all right, so it's not such a big, big problem for the stock side of the market, but it could, in fact, lead to higher interest rates. And this is what I wanted to talk about next, which is, all right, so we, do we see the spending cuts or do we see higher taxes? This is the next 10 years of government spending, as projected out uh, by the CBO. And you can see Social Security and Medicare, two of the entitlement programs, make up about 40% of the total. I mentioned that if you see higher inflation, the interest payment on the debt tends to grow really quickly. That's the light blue piece up there. That also obviously has to get paid. That's about half of the total government spending. And then you look at other mandatory spending, uh, defense and the yellow down there, you're up to about 70%. Basically, when you take a look at the amount that could get cut, that little purple bar on the left, it's not much in terms of expecting a lot of reduction in government spending unless there's uh, something that changes the entitlements over the next few years. And uh, that obviously is politically something that neither party is likely to be willing to touch. So we actually think that a lot of the change in the government uh, basically deficit is likely to happen on the tax side. So what does that mean? Well, it means that you want to be thinking about tax advantaged or tax deferred investments. And that's things like your IRA, 401k, it's things basically where you're able to pay less in taxes. And I would also keep in mind the principle that we call tax diversification. Nobody knows, and I certainly can't tell you, which rates are going up and how much, even if we think tax rates are going up. But what it says is make sure that what you're doing is taking advantage of all the ways you can to pay less in taxes. Now what is that? Municipal bonds, clearly they, uh, they're basically benefiting from uh, paying less in the way of federal taxes. Equities have lower rates on both dividends and capital gains, and even though those are projected to rise, they're likely still to be below the rate on other ordinary income. We're in tax season right now, so many of us are more familiar with all these rates than we might have been at other times. Fully fund retirement accounts, that fits into making sure as women that we're better prepared for retirement. I think that's one of the things that people tend not to do. People tend to pay themselves later. But when you're thinking about what can I do to be sure I'm financially prepared, making sure that you're fully funding your retirement account. And last, that if you already have uh, um, an IRA, think about converting it to a Roth, where basically you pay the taxes now at the lower rate and potentially over time, then are able not to pay taxes in the future. 
So tax diversification, making sure that what you're not seeing, uh, you're not doing, is not taking advantage of things in an era where we're likely to see higher tax rates. In addition to higher tax rates, we're likely also to continue to see the value of the US dollar decline. We think it's really important to be putting some money outside of the US. We recommend up to 25% of your portfolio be an international. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, if you take a look at the world stock markets, uh, more than half of the value of the world stock markets is outside the US. In fact, many people who've done the math just look at the MSCI. That gives you 45% of the market is US. When we looked at all the world stock market, it actually ended up being about 30% of the world stock market was accounted for in US equities, a much, much smaller percent than many people think. So we're not saying, therefore, put 70% outside. We're just saying you might want a little more than you would have thought of in the past. Now, why is that? Well, economic growth varies around the world. We're expecting faster growth in many countries than in the US. And while there's not a direct relationship between returns and economic growth, it's good to have some exposure to faster growing areas. Many of the world's leading companies are based outside the US, and you don't get those if you invest in the US. And if you take a look historically, what we've seen is the US market and foreign markets outperform each other about half the time. So you're able to reduce the risk of your portfolio, reduce the volatility by owning some international equities. To us, that says uh, that's a persuasive reason to include that as part of your overall portfolio. This is actually how we always try to look at investing, which is taking that long-term view, making sure that we're building diversified portfolios. I've talked about that a little bit. And also making sure that you own quality investments. I think this is good rules regardless um, in terms of certainly how women invest as more conservative investors, if you're taking a longer-term view, if you're building a portfolio that can last over a long period of time. And quality investments, in our view, are the ones that are likely to still be around if you're investing over a long period of time, you have to make fewer changes. The last thing is to have a systematic process. And that means putting money to work regularly or pulling it out regularly so the market pays less of a role, plays less of a role in your investment decisions. It turns out that lots of people have done surveys. Only about 15% of us are do-it-yourselfers on most anything, whether it's uh, changing your oil or doing your investing. So we actually strongly suggest you not try to do this yourself unless you're one of that 15% and you're really confident in this. And it's partially because the world makes financial services so difficult. Many women say, I just don't understand this. And that's partly because the whole industry tries to develop terminology, as I've talked through this, this talk, you know, terminology that makes it confusing. Investing is actually pretty simple, but it's not very easy. And for a lot of people, having an advisor is going to be the right way to be sure that what you're getting is the quality investments, that you're not selling off when the market turns down, and that you're also owning the right things over a long period of time. Now, I've sort of done this a little bit because I wanted to talk a little bit about today's market and where we see an opportunity to put money. This is another long-term picture. It's the same S&P 500, but it's drawn a little differently. And you can really see now what makes people feel nervous. Um, the white line is the S&P 500 running through the middle. All I did was take a look at the long-term average, which is uh, down the center of the red line, and then I drew two other lines, one standard deviation on either side and two standard deviations on either side. The green line is the two standard deviations. And you can see, not surprisingly, so this is sort of basic statistics, that the white line tends to stay within those outer green rails most of the time. That's uh, basically, it's, it becomes very overvalued occasionally, and very undervalued occasionally, such as happened, and you can see where it way drops off towards the end, and that's November of 2008. Basically, the market was way below that lower green band. Now, even with the more than 60% gain we've seen over the past year, it's still down there near two standard deviations below that very long-term average. Now, this isn't a sophisticated statistical reason for saying the market's well-valued today, but we look at this and say over a very long-term period of time, the market's tended to trend in that center channel. It's still priced well below that. We think eventually at some point it'll get back into that, and that's part of why we see an opportunity in the stock market today. There's a second way to look at this, which is we just went through a decade of really low returns. Um, I, I forgot to update the slide, so the last number I've got up there is 98 to 2008. 
where over a 10-year period, you lost money investing in stocks. Minus 1% per year. It's minus 1%, it's just it's 0.97, negative 0.97, if you look at 1999 through 2009. So again, a 10-year period where people who put their money into stocks have been very disappointed. And we said, all right, have we seen periods like this before? Because certainly that's not what anybody expected when they put their money into stocks 10 years ago. What happened when we look back at that? And it turns out there were 12 other times starting in 1926 where investors got very, very low returns over an entire 10-year period. Because most of us are long-term investors, but not to get a return over 10 years, that seems way too long to be comfortable with. Well, it turns out there were 12 other decades where that happened, which was, I guess, a bit reassuring. But the thing that was really interesting, because what we wanted to know was, after a decade of low returns, do you also tend to see a decade of low returns or just get better? because we're now investing after 10 years of very low returns today. Well, the interesting thing was, if you look at that center column, the lowest return in the following 10 years after a decade of low returns was a little above 7% per year. Remember, the long-term average is just under 10% per year, so not quite as good as the long-term average, but not bad. And the average over all of these was around 13% per year. That says to us, yes, you tend to see a period of low returns followed by a period of higher returns. And putting your money to work right now in the stock market at a time when everybody's feeling a bit nervous, particularly looking backward at a period of low returns, is likely to be a good opportunity. Do we know for sure that's going to happen? We never know for sure. But we know the historical odds are with us. And if you invest for even longer, if you look at that 20-year period, you end up in double digits in all of the 20-year periods. So that makes us feel a lot more comfortable. This also works in other countries, interestingly enough. We've seen decades of low returns over the last 10 years almost throughout the globe. And you take a look outside of other countries, you also see that same, interesting enough, low 10-year periods tend to be followed by higher 10-year periods. Now, is there a place that you want to invest within stocks? Because I think I've at least explained why I think stocks are a good place to put money right now. The answer is yes. We took a look back to 1972, which was the earliest numbers we could find for this, to say, all right, I'm going to look at the stock market. Is there a way to sort of slice and dice it that gives me a better way to feel more comfortable about the returns I might get? And you might think, OK, the most conservative stocks are the ones with the highest dividend yields, right? You might sort of say, I'm getting more money today. I have less reliance on long-term growth over time. So I want to buy the highest yielding stocks. They turned out to be the worst. This actually surprised me a bit, which is why I start with it. Uh, in the far left, you actually lost money if you bought the highest yielding stocks each year going back to 1972. So uh, that's in the, uh, the, the first column on the left. Um, the second thing was many people invest in technology stocks and some of the other high flyers. Because they don't pay a dividend, they're expected to have very rapid growth. And they're thinking, OK, I'm not getting any dividend. I don't have a company that's uh, giving me any money back but I should get all of the money from capital appreciation. It turns out that they were the second worst performers. You actually made some money, a little more than 1%. That's the little navy bar right there. So the fastest growing stocks, the ones with no dividend at all, uh, actually did pretty poorly as well. Dividend payers did a bit better. They're the blue bar at uh, a little above 7% per year. So if you just buy stocks that pay dividends, that at least puts you in the right ballpark because these are companies that tend to have steadier businesses. They're clearly paying you a dividend every year. Um, and they, many of them expect to grow it over time. Some cut it. We always know that dividends are uncertain. But it turned out that the best group to own uh, above 9% per year was the group of companies that historically paid dividends and increased their dividends every year. So dividends turn out to be very important if you're going to build an individual stock portfolio because you're not only getting the income today, but you get the potential for that dividend growth in the future. And it turns out that the total returns have actually been the highest among all those stocks historically. So we think that's a great place to be looking for. And it certainly fits with many women who are looking to be a bit more conservative. Those tend to be a little less volatile than many of the other stocks because that dividend tends to keep the stock price from moving so much. All right, before I open this up to questions, I want to sort of conclude with a few general remarks. Many people, when they think about investing, they're thinking they need to know what's going to happen to interest rates. 
What's going to happen to oil prices? What's going to happen to the economy? Because those are things that matter a lot in the actual returns you get. But I think many people get hung up on the idea that you can't know those things and you can't predict them. And then how can you invest if you can't know those things? They make a lot of difference in your returns. I'd suggest you take a different approach, which is to say, what are the things you can control? We have sort of talked about this in terms of making a business plan for your life. It's interesting because it applies, we think, to investing as well. Think about the things you do control. If you set up a plan, you know where you're trying to go with your finances, you need to know where you are today, and you need to be saying, what do I need to do over time to get from here to there? If you're saving for retirement, if you're saving to buy a house, whatever your goals are, you need to get from here to there. So your plan is specific to you. It doesn't have much to do with the market. The market may determine how fast you get there. It may have it determine whether you're able to buy a bigger house or a smaller house, but it's not going to be the thing that determines whether you're able to get there. So first of all, have a plan. Second, make sure you own quality investments. If you're going to stay invested over time, you need to have investments that will sort of last as long as your horizon. They won't all do that, but the better you select on quality, the more likely they are to be able to do that. You need to own a diversified portfolio because even the best stocks, the best things that you think are going to do wonderfully, can disappoint. So the more diversified your portfolio, the less risk you're taking with each individual investment. That way what you're doing is minimizing the disappointment that can happen when something you think will do really well turns out not to do so well. So that's sort of how we put together the things that you can control. And the last thing that's really important to control is your emotions and your time horizon. Those two sort of go together. I think of it as, think about the spring time now, you're planting carrots, right? I don't know if it's quite or plate enough to plant carrots here. But uh, think what would happen. You see the little green sprouts coming up? Think what would happen if every week or two you pulled up a carrot to check whether it was growing, because you can't see it growing under, underground, right? Would you ever get any big carrots? No, because you'd be constantly checking. Think of your portfolio the same way. If you're always saying, well, I bought this and it hasn't gone up yet, it's not doing what I think it's going to do, you're probably going to end up making the mistakes of all those people who traded too frequently. You're going to be pulling up all the baby carrots before they've had a chance to get where, you're, where, where they're supposed to go. So make sure you're thinking about the time horizon, letting your investments work over time, and that you're also controlling your emotions so that if the market does go through on one of its periodic uh, dips or corrections or even another bear market, that you're using it as an opportunity rather than seeing it as something that means you have to change how you're investing overall. At this point, uh, let me open it up for, I'm sure I've talked, touched on enough things that there's some questions out there. Yes? Okay. Um, I appreciate your um, conversation. I really get into this kind of stuff. Um, my name is Emily and I have an Edward Jones office up in Eaton. And I've um, met a lot of individual investors here um, the last year that moved a lot of money to cash and to short-term CDs and their retirement accounts, their IRAs. Um, I bet you would recommend them probably talk to an advisor as far as getting money back in. But what would you say um, about dollar cost averaging back in to a mixed portfolio? Or would you recommend those investors pretty much put their money, get it working again for them all at one move? My, I do have a second question too also about um, the short-term interest rate move on uh, corporate bonds versus municipal bonds. And um, what you were saying, how municipal bonds would be more in demand, possibly because of the tax-free interest from them. Um, do you see the longer-term tax-free bonds moving as much as short, or as much as the longer-term corporate bonds and government bonds? Okay, um, let me start on the first one, which is if you have money sitting in short-term cash, your short-term cash right now is earning in treasury bills like a tenth or two tenths of a percent, it's earning almost nothing. So it's really difficult to get enough money if you're trying to save for retirement or save for any other financial goal with something that's earning less than 1%. Think about the fact there's this thing called the rule of 72, which just says that the interest rate you've got, you uh, look at it compared to 72 and it tells you how quickly it doubles. 1%, it takes you 72 years to double your money. One tenth of a percent, you could do the math real fast, 720 years to double your money. So not going to get very far there. So I'd be trying to get people to at least invest in some fixed income, if not in some stocks, 
and get out of the very short term cash on the sidelines. Given that the, for the last year plus, the market's been going higher and if people are still sitting in cash on the sidelines, dollar cost averaging or putting money to work on a regular basis is better than not doing anything. But uh, certainly at the stage where people are likely to put money to work who are, are, who are still on the sidelines, I'm worried it's not, it's not ever too late, but they're certainly waiting a long time through a lot of good returns to get from here to there. So I'd be saying sooner is better, the more you can do, the better, but if people are really reluctant, dollar cast averaging is better than nothing. In terms of the second question, in terms of municipal bonds versus others, yes, there's gonna to continue to be a high demand for municipal bonds. Municipalities right now are issuing Build America bonds where they get the tax credit from the government instead of all of us. So the yields are taxable to individuals, whereas the municipality gets the tax credit, and that's actually a better deal for most municipalities. As a result, I think many municipal bonds are going to hold their value better, even in a rising rate environment, compared to other types of bonds, because you're likely to see more issuance, particularly of federal government bonds. Uh, even corporate bonds, I think, will probably hold their value better. But I think the main principle still is making sure that you own some short-term, some intermediate, and some long-term, because what we don't really know is how much those interest rate increases could be. So, next question. Yes, in the back. I don't think it's, okay. Is it on? All right. Aside from investing in Edward Jones, how does one avoid a Bernie Madoff in their life? Uh, yes, obviously the first thing is uh, go with a reputable firm. And it doesn't have to be Edward Jones. I mean, I'm from Edward Jones and I wanted to make clear what we do, which I think helps people at least understand how we approach investing. Um, I think there's two things. Um, with Bernie Madoff, I think we all know that what he promised was very steady returns, which sounded like no risk, and was able to do so over time, and people were very perplexed about how he could be getting such steady returns in both up and down markets. Um, that fits, in my view, as one of the first things that everybody needs to pay attention to, which is, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So always be skeptical about something that sounds like either a high return for no risk, or in that case, a very steady return for you know, basically in all kinds of markets. Now, it's not that everybody who promises something that sounds good is therefore a fraud, but I think it's incumbent on all of us, since clearly the regulators don't protect individuals the way we might like, to be sure we've checked into what is the track record, who is the firm, and to be sure that what you've got is something that sounds like a reasonable rate of return for the investments you've put to work. I would also say that, uh, and this is just, it, again, in general, that what you want is not necessarily the largest firm, but a firm where you're getting the statements from the firm and not from the individual. That wouldn't have protected you in the Bernie Madoff case, but would protect you in the cases of many similar Ponzi schemes where it's one or two individuals that take the money and then send you a statement and it looks really good, and then they have gone with the money and it's gone. And that's actually a much more frequent form of fraud, where it's somebody that seems very trustworthy and then actually has sort of been cooking the books on a very small scale rather than a bigger scale. So that wouldn't have helped you in the Bernie case, but it would have helped from many other scams that we see out in the marketplace. But that's part of the trouble is financial services, um, yes, there's regulation, but it really pays to be cautious. And, uh, and you know, I don't, I don't have a perfect way to say, here's how you could avoid being taken advantage of. Um, it's difficult and you need to do homework. Over here. Sure, what are some of the companies that fall in the category of paying dividends and growing the dividends? Um, when you take a look, uh, I'll start with one that will probably surprise you. Um, they're across all industries, but uh, one that I talk about today because it is a surprising one is Intel. It's a company that has a yield of about 3%. It's regularly raised its dividend for about the last 10 years, and we expect it to grow its dividend by more than 5% per year over the next few years. Um, the second one is Johnson & Johnson. The uh, company has been paying dividends since about 1950, uh, growing its dividend every year over that time period. Uh, internationally diversified, I like companies that operate globally as well as domestically. Um, it's in 100 countries around the world, but again, steady dividend grower over time. 
uh, a company like United Technologies, which does carrier air conditioners. Um, it does, of course, the helicopters, Pratt & Whitney engines. It's in a variety of different businesses. We see it taking advantage of the basically global infrastructure investments that we're seeing. Lots of countries around the world are investing more in roads and bridges. They do things like that. They also do Otis elevators. Uh, I don't recall off the top of my head how long it's paid the dividend, but again, one that we expect to raise the dividend over the next five years by 5% or more. But those are the types of companies. You're generally looking for larger companies that are well diversified in their businesses. They have a track record of paying dividends. Now, I will point out, almost all of the big banks fell into this category before the past two years. So this doesn't say you aren't going to find disappointments, but what it says is, the history of those companies, even with the financial services included, which have really performed poorly over the last couple of years, tends to do a lot better. But don't forget to be really well diversified because any individual company can run into problems or can run into an industry problem. And that's part of why I'm naming names in a variety of different industries. You want to be sure it's not just one group of dividend paying stocks that you focus on. So, but that would be some examples of the companies that we would like in that area. So, Yes. I'm sorry? Just one more question. One more question. Yes. I'm not sure if this is um, something that you could uh, answer or not. I keep talking, it goes on in a minute. Is it working now? No. Yeah. Anyway, um, I have a lot of ones. It's all good. Um, in terms of how the economy affects smaller communities, smaller companies, like I said, I'm not sure that this is a question that you can answer, but I figure I might as well put it out there. Is there usually a three to six month lag in smaller communities, or is that just my imagination? The question was, how does the economy affect smaller communities, or is there a three to six month lag between what we see in the overall economic growth and what tends to happen in smaller communities? Unfortunately, there's no rule like that. So if you take a look across the country, no surprise, when we talk about the US economy, it's actually made up of lots of the smaller communities aggregated together. But no small community looks exactly like the overall economy. What we saw coming out of the 2000, or I'm sorry, the, the 1990, 1992 downturn, not the last one, but the one before, uh, was what got called the rolling recession. Because the economy as a whole actually was showing positive growth, but different areas of the country actually were still in recession. So you had some areas with strong growth and some that actually were still in recession. So lots of people were asking the question you're asking, which is, hey, when, when do we catch up? Right now, what we're seeing is strength, oddly enough, in consumer spending. Everybody thought the American consumer was dead. We're seeing strength in exports, so depending on how the local community is tied into the export market or not. We're actually seeing some strength in construction, but it's because itself is such a low base that uh, it looks like it's positive, it's helping overall growth, but I think most people in the construction business would say things are really terrible, and that's because they're still so far down from where they were. And of course, what we're seeing is a lot of strength in government spending because of the big stimulus plans. So when you take a look at a local community, it's gonna depend on how all of those things play out locally. Um, but no, unfortunately there's no great, yes, smaller communities come along a little bit later, what you tend to see is within the year, a year after the pickup in the overall economy, almost all small communities have caught up. And it's because the general tendencies have got strong enough that whatever the local economy is, it tends to tie into at least one of them. And the strength is broad enough that it's caught up in many of those local areas. So I'd say by the end of the year, even if it's not, if you're not seeing much of a pickup now, you should be seeing it. But again, it really depends on the local mix of, of the economy. Well, thank you so much, uh, and I appreciate being here. Thank you, Kate, uh, for that. We have about 15 minutes uh, before our lunch. I just want to let you know that we will be joined during lunch. Uh, our luncheon is a broader Business Plus speaker series. And so uh, other people will be coming in for lunch. So if you want to sit where you're sitting, you might want to make sure you reserve it. Um, and uh, our lunch speaker will be Diane Pan, and we're looking forward to that as well. So about 15 minutes, and we'll reconvene for lunch. Thank you.